You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land, a variable feast of movies, Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip. With Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rubin. Today's topic is Confessions of a Hollywood Starlet with Carol Hollenbeck. And now, here's Julian, Arthur, Steve, and Carol. First of all, I want to congratulate you, Carol, for winning the contest to be our very first co-host. That is true. And we're, excited. We're, we're excited to have you here. Very excited. Um, before we get into our interview with you, which is absolutely going to be fascinating, um, I wanted to take a moment because in the last week of New Year's, we lost four top performers, and I thought we could take a moment to share a little bit of thought about them. Absolutely. Uh, Tom Wilkinson, Shecky Green, oh, yeah. I know. Uh, Tom Smothers, and Glennis Glennis Johns, Glennis right? Johns. Of course. Glennis. Glennis Johns, correct. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I thought I, when I first saw that Tom Wilkinson had passed, I, I, that really struck me because he has been a mainstay character actor and an Academy Award nominee in so many good films. The first time I ever saw him was in Shakespeare in Love. He played Mr. Fennyman, the money in the in their little Shakespeare production of Romeo and Julia, and he was so dastardly fun. He's also uh, Mike, he's George Clooney's colleague, rather odd, off the edge colleague, in Michael Clayton a few years ago. Very very powerful actor and a big loss. Uh, Shecky Green, one of the great character actors. Uh, Julian, you've interviewed everybody, including God. <laughs> who, who did you ever talk to Shecky? I never talked to him, but I watched him in Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. It was a pleasure to watch Shecky Green because he was a, one of these guys who could do almost anything, and he had absolutely manic behavior at times because he later was even confessed that he was bipolar. But he would climb literally the stage curtain at times. I mean, he would do things that no one had done, but he was funny. He could do. He was a great mimic. He was. He was terrific. But no, I never did interview him, Steve. Well, I I did meet Shecky several times, uh, and he was a, just a terrifically nice nice person. Uh, and he he had a, a kind of like a reputation uh, that when you saw him perform, you either saw a great performance or you saw a bad performance. Strange. Now, I saw him both ways. Uh, I saw him when he just kind of like phoned it in. I think he was probably on alcohol at the time. Uh, I think it was the MGM. And then uh, I saw him at, at a Paramount, uh, did a, uh, uh, a luncheon uh, for all of the exhibitors and, and uh, people in the business uh, showing their product. And they had Shecky as the entertainer, and he was great. So when I saw him at, when, at the top of his game, he was as good as anybody I've ever seen. Great, great talent, great performer, a very sweet man, and lived to be 97, yeah, Steve, is that yeah, right? Yeah, he was one of the ones in that uh, past that was really up there, yeah. And a co-star of my favorite television series of all time, Combat. The first season, he was one of the squad under Vic Morrow and Rick Jason mm -hmm. and did a very good job playing a credible World War II soldier. Uh, speaking of comics, we also lost... Tommy Smothers. Yes. And if you were around in the oh, 60s, oh, yeah. Tommy Smothers and his brother Dick Smothers, the Smothers brothers, were just a, a, a giant force in television. You guys have any thoughts on the Smothers brothers? They broke, they, broke, uh, they broke ground. They did things that every network tried to stop them. They'd fight CBS. They just came out and did against the Vietnam War. They did many things. They were they were way ahead of their time. Just mention Glennis Johns for a second because for me, I know that she did a lot of things, but uh, one of my favorite comedies of all time is The Court Jester oh, yeah. with Danny Kaye. Yes, 
and she played the love interest. Uh, she played a, an officer in uh, in the uh, rebel army per se, and uh, she's so adorable in that movie. I, the word I want to use is so fetching uh, as as the captain. Um, any thoughts on Glennis Johns, guys? Well, I have a lot because I happily saw her on Broadway twice. Once in the star of a little night music, yes. but the second time, listen to this cast on Broadway: Rex Harrison, Glynis Johns, and Stuart Granger in something called The Kingfisher. And the interesting thing about it, besides how great the cast was, was that Rex Harrison at that time was blind, and she would lead him. From the wings onto the stage, he would do his performance. He'd take him off. It was really touching and incredible to see. Did you, Arthur, please dive into your examination of Carol's early influences? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Carol. So thank you for the introduction to all of these uh, people who passed away, Steve. Uh, yes. Sad, but it keeps going on week after week. Carol, so you're in Newburgh, New York, and what makes you go to Hollywood, California? Well, where do you go when you don't want to be an actress, but you want to be a movie star? Uh, I came to Hollywood not to be an actress, to be a movie star. Okay. And so tell me, tell us about that. That it was going to be, I was going to get discovered. I was going to, everything like what happened to Lana Turner, that happened to, you know, the blonde image type thing. I was just going to just... Be gussied away and stardom was coming at me. And How old were you when you left? About 20. 20. Had, you, had you done some acting in Not school? Not really, no. No. You were going to go sit in Schwab's Lux, a drugstore in seven? I mean, that's yes. kind of seriously. I did do a little acting, yes, but not in school, no. But uh, I did get discovered walking down the street in Hollywood Boulevard, which was very interesting. The first... A year that I was there, things were falling in place the way I had thought. I got walking down Hollywood Boulevard. This lady came running after me and said, "Are you an actress? Are you are you a model or something?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Oh, oh, you got to come with me. No, <laughs> today I wouldn't do it. You got to come with me because we need somebody for this commercial. So I go with her. Next thing I know, I'm in the makeup, getting made up. Next thing you know, I'm I'm doing I'm doing Miss Vanilla Skybar candy commercial. And there's Miss uh, Strawberry and there's Miss Chocolate. And there's Artie Johnson. And I'm laughing. What a, I'm, I'm laughing because it's all a myth. The Hollywood stories is a myth. It's a fantasy. But just, I thought, so being young and naive and from a small town, very uh, somewhat sheltered, thrown to the wolves. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, I guess it's just going to happen. And then after that, I ended up in Vegas, showgirl. I uh, worked with Julia. Excuse me for a second. When you were on yes. Hollywood Boulevard getting discovered, what year was that? 61, 62, because I ended up working in Vegas about 63. Okay, go on. I worked in Vegas in uh, the Riviera Hotel with Julia Proud. Uh, and pa Carol, could I interrupt just for a second? I'm really curious. Uh, coming from a sheltered small town, was there a lot of resistance from your parents for you to leave and go to Hollywood? I, I, and no, there was not. Oh, you know why? I'll take, cause I, you know, okay. It was because I had relatives in California. Well, you know, we'll get into your movie in a bit, but, uh, I looked at the poster for Eden Cried yeah. and you're, you're there on the poster. Yeah. And, uh, on the hat. <laughs> and obviously you are a, what we would call in contemporary terms, a real hottie. Yeah, I was a hottie. Uh, I was. How, how tall, how tall were you? Close to five, seven. You were a classic pinup girl. Yeah, yeah, I was. I have the, uh, yeah, this is the coffee cup that you can buy on Amazon. Uh, Eden cried. I have, there's 34 products with my picture on. I get no money. So you've done your first and commercial. Yes. I, is that, does, does that get you in to see other people? What does that do for you? I, I ended up, I had to join the union because... I did the, the commercial. The only thing that I got out of that was the feeling that everything that I felt about Hollywood land was true. <laughs> the fantasy was coming to reality. And I hope to see a, a few smiles because I, I laugh at it now, you know, but because it, you know, it, it was a, a rude awakening. 
Carol, you know, a dear, a dear friend of mine is a was is and was a personal manager of many stars. Right. And so he walked into a bank one day uh, in Hollywood to do his banking. And he saw a very beautiful girl and he walked up to her and said, you know, uh, are you an actress? Are you? And she said, no, I'm modeling and stuff. He said, well, if you'd like to be an actress, I'd be very interested in, in managing you. And he gave her a card and he said, please give me a call. She said, well, let me talk to my mother about it. And she, and she took the card and she called and he became her manager. Her name uh, is um, uh, Charlize Theron. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it, it does oh, happen. Oh, yeah. It, it does happen. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Again, it happened to Anna Turner. It happened to a few other people. Of course it does happen. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about like the myth of it, you know. Carol, what uh, tipped you off that you could get a job in Vegas? Uh, another good question. <laughs> uh, I ended up being uh, asked again to come to an audition. Somebody asked me to go to an audition, and I went to, um, oh, my God, I know his name like I uh, know my own, but I spoke about him many, many years. It was a... Um, um, I not a, a producer of Vegas shows. Uh, it's okay. We, we, we wouldn't. Make I, it I can't. Anyway, so I went to this audition and they went around boom, 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 and it picked me. You know, and next thing. I, and did you say that you were going to work for Juliet Prowse's show? Irma LaDuce. I oh. was in that. Irma LaDuce played Streetwalker showgirl, and then it was a showgirl for a while that with Lily Saint Cyr. I was not, you know, I was not with her. I mean, she was, we were walking around the thing or whatever. She she was a stripper, yes, right? Yeah. And then I, uh, yeah. And then I, I worked for Joe okay. Lewis, the fighter. Um, I was a ring girl for Joe Lewis. Was he no. fighting at the time? No, no, he was, he was putting on, he, he had been retired. He was, uh, working in, uh, most of the time, I think in Vegas, but he, he had this, ch uh, Toys for Touch charity and at the Moulin Rouge. So I was there for like a week or two doing Ring Girl. And that's where, uh, Cassius Clay almost ran me down to get on the stage to say, I'm the greatest. You're going to know about me. And in the meantime, I'm trying to hold on the wall. <laughs> he just almost knocked me down. But, uh, you know, it, that, that's. Now, now when pretty, pretty girls go to Las Vegas to appear in shows, many times they have to be topless. No. I assume that no. you didn't have to do no, that. No, we were in a, a play as a showgirl. We were in uh, playing right. French hookers, but no, no, uh, sweaters and very French with berets and stuff like that. Um, no, I didn't um, have to do that. I did another showgirl thing and I did and one in New York, but I didn't have to do any of the topless stuff. I, what was Vegas like in the early sixties? Uh, oh, well, I have no, I have no way to compare it to, uh, anything today because I haven't been to Vegas in years, but, uh, it was, ah, uh, I mean, you know, I just regret, regret, regret that I didn't meet the Rat Pack. You know, I, I would have loved to. I just didn't get to the sands at the right time or something. That was that was the right time. Julian, you were in Vegas in the early 60s, oh. weren't you? Oh, I sure, I sure was. And I, it was an incredible time. Yeah. I talked about this, Carol, about the shows yeah. in the lounges. Yes. The shows in the lounges where you had Louis Primer yes, and Kelly Smith. Smith and, Absolutely. And, and Don Rickles yes. at that time. Yes. And Mort Saul. Yes. I mean, these were the people oh. playing the lounges. You're so right. And they were Did you get to know any of the so-called stars at that time or meet any of them for any length of time? No, I didn't because I was a different person. I, I was very, believe in me, I was even a little older than some of the showgirls there, maybe, well, a few years older. They were like, they were like real professional stuff. I mean, they had, they had done a lot of stuff. I, I, I'm not putting a halo on my head. I just came from a, a sheltered background uh, to a certain degree, and I was very, I was naive, very, very naive, and uh, so um, you know, and and it took me a long time to get out of that. But I was like amazed. I, I'd hear stories from these girls, and I go, "Oh my God, you did that! You did that!" You know, it sounded like I was judgmental. It was just that 
I, I really came from a very small, small town, but very small, uh, like values of, uh, you know, um, the fifties values. I, I went to Virgin until I was 23. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like you must have been fighting off men. Well, I mean, it would sound yeah, that way. Yeah, if you yeah, I was. Not only that, I fought off men. I had, uh, you know, uh, issues with, uh, you know, um, situations um, where I was, you know, attacked and stuff in Hollywood. Uh, casting couch was, be- a, that became known to me after I had, yeah, you know, I had been ushered into doing things without any problems, you know, like getting on the sky by commercial, getting the showgirl, doing the other things. It, then it suddenly, it, then the darkness came and, and then it suddenly, and that's one of the reasons I left. Carol, can, are, can you, since people are interested in this area and it's obviously a, a warning for young women today, even about how to deal with, uh, people who take advantage of you, can you describe one of those incidents? And I was in a drugstore. And in comes this guy, and he says, you know, uh, a, you know, you need an agent or something like that. And I, he said, there's somebody that would really like to talk to you. So I fell for it because it was midday. And I walk up into the building, get into the elevator. He opens the door for me to walk into it. And then he opens another door. And I go in, and I sit down. And this guy comes out from behind the desk. And jumps on top of me, and I had. So well, let me let me understand this. One guy brought yeah, you up, and yeah. there was the second yeah. guy. Is that it? Okay. The the guy he brought me to just pounced on me, and I fought my way out of it. I did fight my way. This person who attacked me in the office was very good friends with. Let me just say Frank Sinatra, and I love Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra wouldn't have to do anything. I, I really liked him. I regret never meeting him. He was a person I heard very good things about. But this person who attacked me was at that time, but then somebody told me they he had shoved this guy aside. He didn't want him in, in his life anymore. So, uh, Frank Sinatra's, um, I, oh God, I don't want to, Frank Sinatra, he, he had nothing to do with it. I loved that man, and but I would have no problem with trying to go out with Frank Sinatra, let me tell you. Carol, excuse me, I'm I'm curious in terms of a large man comes across the desk, jumps yeah. on top yeah. of you. Uh what what did you do to get out of there? Because you you probably didn't have any martial arts training. No, I didn't. I pushed he got on top of me, and all I can remember is I pushed I I I knuck I hit him in the in the this area down here, and he ended up getting off of me and I ran out of there. And he said, "You're not going to work here anymore, or whatever." I don't know. Do you guys? Do you guys know the great story of Shecky Green with Sinatra when he he I said this Frank Sinatra. Sinatra saved his life? Do you know that story, guys? I do. No, what's the story, Arthur? The story is the story. It's a great line. He opened. He opened for Sinatra, and he did a bad show. So after the show, several of Sinatra's guys started beating oh, him up, oh. and Sinatra and Sinatra Sinatra walked into the dressing room and said, "That's enough," which means he saved his life. Before you did your movie, Eden cried. Were you getting some other parts or I, nothing? Going I was on getting. Yet? I was getting a big promotion. They were promoting me as the next Marilyn Monroe. I was on a lot of covers. I was on a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of covers of local papers. A lot of covers of magazines. I was out with people. Uh, told to go out with certain people, get my picture taken. Everything. I was giving out awards to people. I was, as, as, you know, just thrown like that. It was okay, but. It, it, I wasn't getting any real work. It was like a model, uh, a model. And did you have an agent? Were you connected with an agency, Carol? No, I had a manager. I had a manager. Oh, you had a manager. Okay. Manager was getting. And who was that? Uh, his name was Glenn Gregory. He, uh, passed away now, of course. Did he have any successful clients? Not really. No, no. I was like his most one that he put for. Did you ever see the movie Showgirls? Yeah, I, I, yeah. That was the 90s, mid-90s or so. For me, I like being a showgirl. It was fun. Um, and it's it's kind of a, to be a Las Vegas showgirl is kind of like a a nice thing to have in your... Well, it's a good life, isn't it? Yeah, you know, but I left. Nice... I left. I left it after a couple months because of the fact that the mob came in and wanted us to mingle. 
And I wanted to go back to the my aunt and uncles who lived in uh, the suburbs of L.A. or whatever. And I wanted to go back and stay there and get situated into Hollywood. I didn't want to always have to mingle with the people. When you use the word mingle, I assume that you were probably going to be asked to be participate in some sexual things. I've had things happen to me, but that's not one of them. I didn't do that. I left. I left because I wanted to go back to Hollywood. I thought I can get the, but I will tell you one particular thing that is very interesting. Uh, it's going on today in our world and, and right now, absolutely right now it's happening. And that's the Epstein thing. Every Epstein yes. thing where they just came out with more. Okay. This happened to me a long time ago. The same, same identical thing. And I escaped it. Uh, I'll tell you why the, the whole th- situation is that when I was in Hollywood and getting all this promotion, which I was, there was also a movie going on, getting ready to start called Harlow. Gene Harlow. Right. Joe Lumine was, to, and then there the, was the Bill Sargent one, whatever. So make a long story short, I was out. My manager said, you know, this election year, you go out and campaign. So we made up these signs. Vote with my picture. Vote Carol Holland. I was under Carol Holland, by the way. Uh, Holland Beck is my real. Vote Carol Holland for the Gene Harlow story. So we put all of these posters all over the place. And I would go to voting areas and stuff. And I'd hand out my ballots and everything. I got and had a hoppers column. I got a, a, a Zanuck had uh, was had called me or whatever. So I did get, uh, you know, what I did also get out of this is a very weird situation. So one day after doing all this promotion, maybe it was about a week or so, my manager says to me, um, there's a woman who's calling. She wants to meet you. I said, OK, OK, fine. And he said, I don't know. She keeps calling and it doesn't seem right to me. And so he called the FBI and the FBI, for somehow he knew the woman's name or something. The FBI said, oh, we know she, you know, we're after the big, the big honcho, the big pimp. And he's on the wanted list. Can you, can we meet? So I, we met at Wolfie's uh, delegate over to my manager, somebody out in the FBI guy, me, and they wanted me to go and be a, de- a decoy. Because the man behind this wanted me. He wanted me uh, to procure me, uh, to send me to Saudi Arabia or Iran. You know, it wasn't sex trafficking of uh, the bad, of the um, poor kind. It was sex trafficking of the elitist, wealthy kind or whatever. So I was scared to death. There we go. I'm maybe 23 then. I said, I'm scared. I'm scared. I don't want to do it. And that please do it. You've got to, you've got to do it. We got to get this guy. And I said, I just, I said, okay, I would do it if I had some protection. And so that and it didn't work out, but I never got, but it was a woman like that, Christina Maxwell or whatever. It was like her who was procuring for this man and she was after me. So the same thing went on years ago that's going on for rich people. So anyway, I ended up um, going in a car with with somebody I know. And behind me was the people from the FBI and the people that were in uh, the car, uh, my manager, people like that. They were like way behind, kind of following us. So that's the only way I felt safe to do it. I still get really weird when I think about it. I'm just take, so what happened? I'm taking up very up to uh, the Hollywood Hills somewhere. And there I was, uh, it, but it wasn't like a glamorous place. It was like a, I remember it, I, I can't remember, it was like a big, like a factory or like a farm, like a big, big factory style. And the guy gets me out of the car and he, we go into the door and there's a big balcony. So he's, I look up there because there's nobody around. And this guy comes out to the balcony and the guy who was with me, who escorted me, and he said, this is Carol Holland the one you want to see, and she's here. But I must tell you, there are people that are ta- are waiting for her. And he ran down the stairs, and where somebody was waiting for him, took him away. So the FBI didn't get him. But the reason I'm bringing it up is it's a same thing that's happening today was happening then. 
I give you credit for being a very brave girl to go on that uh, sojourn because uh, that took guts. Yeah, it did. It did. It's uh... Carol. Were you meeting any stars in those days in the sixties? Any? Any? Uh, did you get involved with any stars? No, I, any I, I could have, but I, I didn't. I was some some men were after me that were married. Uh, there was an actor named John Erickson. Yeah. Oh, sure. And of he, course. I was a fan of his, and and he was after me. And then, oh, Dennis Cole. I dated Dennis Cole. Dennis Cole. Who, he, Carol, how how good looking a guy was John Erickson? Uh, he was he was a stunning man gorgeous. who almost made stardom. Almost got he there. was absolutely gorgeous. And but yeah. uh, he he came on to me so, I mean, <laughs> I mean like <laughs> he almost just <laughs> threw me down on the. He didn't do anything, but I just got very frightened. I said, you're married, you know. His wife is in the other room. I mean, I don't know. And then. Uh, Jeannie Crane's husband, he came on to me. Uh, uh, oh. the Toastmaster. Jessel. George Jessel. George Jessel. Jessel. He, I dated George him. Jessel. Oh, but God. yeah, went to Chasen's. He, he was okay. He'd, he called me, wanted me to go out. I, I, you know, yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, I did. I did. I had, uh, yeah, Dennis Cole was nice. Uh, I, I don't know. I left. I told, I told the guys recently a funny story about John Erickson oh. that I had met his daughter when she was in her thirties, and his daughter looked exactly like him. Wow, was that? And she was gorgeous. I'm yeah, telling well, you. He was... You know, uh, uh, John Erickson was the original Sefton on Broadway in Stalag Seventeen. Yes. Didn't know yes. that, Steve. Good one. Yeah. And yeah. he starred in a movie called Pretty Boy Floyd. Yep. yep. Pretty Boy Floyd. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh. He, so, he his type that would they were, these guys were the movie stars of the fifties and the sixties. Yeah. And up to Bonnie and Clyde probably. Carol, how did Eden Cry come into your oh, life? Oh, Eden Cry came into my life. Somebody wanted me for this film, I guess. I didn't audition. Never did. Never auditioned. I uh, I think uh one of the producers had a major um thing for me. Didn't bother me, but had a major thing for me and uh was gonna get this movie and I was going to star in it and I don't know I guess that was going to make me a star and maybe he would get something out of it too I don't know but I we ended up doing it and okay the film turned out to be not so good we had the hometown premiere Walter Reed came along and decided to distribute it and would t- and they all talked about me Newberg having a premiere hometown premiere that that in those days that was still a wonderful thing to happen. And it was a wonderful thing to happen. When you were making the movie, did you think it was going to be terrible or was, did you not know? I did not know. I was hoping, of course, that, you know, this too had happened with sort of happenstance without really having to struggle. And I thought maybe this is my, my door going to open for me. After the premiere, I couldn't find it for years. I did not want to. I did not want to find this film. And I, as far as I'm concerned, I, anybody who even my hometown mentioned it to me, I would get cringe because then I, I came back from Hollywood after the, having the premiere there, going back to Hollywood because also I went to Universal and I had to sit on a casting person's lap with a bikini on reading a script. Tell us a little bit how that came about. Well, the, I got an audition. I'm told I have to put this bathing suit. It was a bikini and I come out. And then he's all, oh, well, you have to sit on my lap. I said, you had to sit on his lap to read a script? To read the part, yeah. I think that that's probably something that would be an alarm to me. <laughs> yeah, well, it was uh, alarm to me. But I didn't yeah. think it was anything. I thought maybe it's a beach thing. I didn't, you know, I, I thought, well, maybe I have to do this. But I didn't, nothing happened. It was in his office. There was nothing happening. I I just left. You know, Carol, one of, one of the most shocking scenes in uh, the Marilyn Monroe oh. movie that Steve mentioned uh, with Anna de Armas, is that what's yes. her name? Yeah. Was when she goes into the office and then he just, just, uh, everything happens. Uh, really a jarring uh, scene. Presuming it really happened, it must have been absolutely well, a lot devastating. Happened to Marilyn that. Monroe and, you know, yeah. a lot she, uh, she was very naive about. Carol, you, you mentioned earlier 
that you uh, were being touted to be in one of the two Harlow movies. Oh, yes, movies. let me get, oh, yes. I got something very good coming out of that. I was called by Regis Philbin to come to his office. And uh, he had taken over the Steve Allen show. So I went there and he said, You're, you are possibly going to go on tonight. We are going to deck, uh, put, uh, put you in Gene Harlow's outfits. And um, you are, you're going to be, from here you'll go to the costume, get made up, and you're going to be on tonight as a Gene Harlow contender. And I was sitting there like, I'm going to national TV tonight with, like, Gene Harlow, my God, had this, you know, this came out, Hattie Harper's column and all this stuff was, so make a long story short, I said, oh my God, I'm lady. Then the phone rang and it was Joseph Levine. And he said, we signed Carol Baker to the role. The Regis hangs up and he says, I'm sorry, we can't put you on TV. There's no more. Oh, so I left. Carol, I'm interested in knowing you, you made it perfectly plain at the beginning that you wanted to get to Hollywood to be a movie Yeah, star. that's it. Okay. What was the decision? What made you say, I'm leaving? What was the specific, was there a specific incident that you said, that's it? Yeah. Uh, I'm leaving because uh, I had an affair with the, uh, the son of the agent, and I didn't think he was going to do anything for me. Um, I'm leaving because uh, it's all about the casting couch. So there were all those things that factored into, you know what? I think I need to go back to New York and become an actress, really study and do that. And I was very good in Eden Cried. And uh, by the way, to to capitalize on the Eden Cried thing, many years later, I ended up doing a video and people asked me and I had started to feel a little bit better about the fact, you know, I did this. This happened. It was a hometown premiere. I should really like that and not stick with the negative. And so I proudly said, yeah, I did a movie and a video in my, uh, we had, you know, in a, a theater and I did a movie and I did this and I did that and I did, and the name of it was, they asked the name of it and I said, even cried. And the next time we met, cause I was a theater group, the woman pipes up and says, I found your movie. I said, you found my movie. I knew he's found the movie. I don't know what you, <laughs> and I was a little bit sad that she found it because I thought I don't like the movie and I don't like, it was not good. I got a copy and we, uh, we showed the screenings of, of Eden Cry. I was amazed. I fell in love with the movie because they changed it. They did a narration and the guy, and they say in the review, sounds like Jack Nicholson and he's making fun of everything. <laughs> like, oh, they're, all the young people don't have any, they can't make love unless it's in the sand in California. It was a breath of fresh air to see this film. And I love this film now. This is like amazing. I've embraced it. Everybody loved it. When, when you came back to New York, Carol, yeah. to study acting. Yeah. Did you study with anyone we would know? Herbert Berghoff, and, HB Studios. Oh, so you were at HB. HB. Okay. Uh, was Uda Hagen there? No, the Uda Hagen was not. She was doing plays and stuff. Yeah. Was I there. See. So did you did you study for a while? Did you do any theater? Oh, yes, I did off-Broadway. Uh, a lot of off-Broadway, yeah. I did a lot of off-Broadway. I did CBS soap operas. I had a manager. And, uh, you know... Um, and he died on me. Um, so he said, I don't, you know, I don't know who else is going to make you a star. You'll have to find somebody else. He had cancer. It was, and you might know the name. He managed Kim Novak. He managed Burgess Meredith. He managed Patty Shayevsky. <laughs> Got a story about him, whatever. I uh, managed uh, a lot of people. His name what was Bobby Sanford. He was very, he lived, he was in the Sardi building. Uh, his office, and um, and uh, he um, he he handled Frederick March. Um, and I could, we had quite a lineup I, of I, people. I, that Julian, was. Julian, when you were at we read, did the title Eden Cry come across your desk? Does that ring a bell at all? At that particular time, I was in the television division. This was a company called Continental oh, Film. Yes. That was that was Walter Reed's of. Uh, theater, you know, distribution for motion pictures. All I knew was that uh, the rumor was 
there's this movie, It Really Is Bad. Yes. I, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now I have yeah. to tell you, it's so bad it's good. <laughs> because it's, <laughs> well, now it's, it's good. Corny. Look at that. It's, it's funny. funny. It's funny because. It's a cult film now. It became a, like a fine wine. Carol. Yes, it is. It is like, uh, what, what as far as celebrities who I uh, went around with here in town is, um, uh, in New, New York, you mentioned about, I, I met, I'm, I'm more open. I was a little bit, a little intimidated in Hollywood. Uh, by the way, you, you're describing this movie. It sounds like it's a lot of fun, yeah. a crazy scene. I love on it. How, how in the devil did the title of the movie become Nobody Eden knows. Cried? It sounds like a terrible title. Nobody knows. I can't explain it. I even copied the lyrics. But the lyrics started to make some sense. But it, it's like nobody knows why. But I guess Eden, East of Eden, Eden this, Eden that. There's several films named Eden. And I think that keeps it in. The, because whenever I mention it, they're, everybody irks up. Oh, Eden. They think it's one of the Eden. But it, oh, so your know. character name in the movie is not Eden. No, it's Lorraine. Garden. Lorraine, okay. So they're referring to Eden being a place yeah. like the Garden of Eden that's not really the Garden no. of Eden because it's crime. No. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and another thing is the guy who plays the lead, boyfriend or husband, and because we're teenagers, I did look, I did look like I could be seventeen, but I was really gorgeous with the blonde hair and the the Marilyn Monroe walking and all of that stuff. And, but, and they gave me costumes. I had, I had costumes like you wouldn't believe beautiful costumes. And the guy who played my husband or boyfriend, you know, how he was playing a 17, he was 35. <laughs> I like it. You live everything as and 35 and he looked every bit of it. <laughs> and I said, that's Hollywood for you. When they want somebody, they want them. At what point did you uh, decide to leave show business, so to speak? Back in the 90s, uh, early 90s, um, the the age range uh, and the fact that the people like Ellen Bernstein, who's, you know, they're older than me, but whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm a senior. I mean, way into my senior. And uh, they were going to get the roles and I wasn't going to, you know, so it was it would be hard for women anyway. It was harder for women then. Um and and now it's getting better, but uh, I just I wanted to write, and I just wanted to get away from uh, that whole thing. I because I didn't see a future in it, and so I did murder mysteries. I did a lot of interactive murder mysteries and stuff, but I didn't see a lot of future in it. But uh, now you're enjoying yourself as a writer. Yeah, I, I am. I'm enjoying myself as a writer. I'm gonna, and also as I said, I met a, a Carol Baker. And you know Carol Baker did Baby Doll, and uh, and she's wonderful. She's a friend of mine. Uh, I'm going yeah, she to, she also <laughs> was the other. Uh, Arlo, Arlo. That's what I mean. That's we connected on that when she had she was at the National Arts Studio in uh, National Arts Club in New York near the Players Club down in Gramercy Park, and somebody said Carol Baker is speaking tonight about this book she wrote. She she was a writer, and I said, oh my god, we got to go, we got to go. We went. I. I cornered her. I, I bought her book. We hugged each other. I said, I know you from the 60s. I was considered for the other Jean Harlow. And we connected right away. So, you know, we're friends. I have her number. I'm, I'm going to a talk. Which, which, which Jean Harlow was Red Buttons, the manager? Uh, that was uh, Carol Baker. Carol, Carol Baker, yeah. You know, for the for the listeners who don't know the story, two movies in 1965 get greenlit at the exact same time, one with Carol Lindley, one with Carol Bur- uh, Carol Baker, and they're both called Harlow, and they're both released the same year, which doesn't happen very often. Okay, now you're coming. A friend of mine, Tom LaSanta, wrote a book and published it himself called The Dueling Harlows. And I got a mm-hmm. copy of it. It was very interesting, although I didn't finish reading it. So guess what? McFadden, I think it's McFadden Publishers, Publishing Company, uh, bought it. And it's putting it out in a beautiful cover. They have Carol Baker, Carol Lindley, and then the camera, the old camera right in the middle. And it's really gorgeous, glossy paperback, big paperback. It's coming out in March. I'm in it. 
I have a picture and an interview with Tom Lusanti, who's a friend of mine. So he put me in there. He said, there's the three carols. <laughs> the blonde, the blonde lives the three on. Carols. <laughs> I tell you, my wife has found her way into a lot of these 1930s movies on TCM. Oh, yeah. Uh, and pointed out to me just how great Jean Harlow really was. Yes. She was a star in every in every which way, and she could act. Yes, she could. Uh, but uh, her life, her uh, that she died so oh, young. Yeah. My I Lord. It. She, and by the way, when you people talked about uh, that movie Blonde, that based on Joyce Carol Oates' book, that you you all saw, and I I heard your your talk about the all about Marilyn Monroe. Agree yes. with you on. I mean, I felt it was such. You did it with such class. Talked about and and I, I mentioned that earlier. It was refreshing, and nobody talked about her in a bad way. Not that people do really, but there was so much dignity in all of your comments about her. Carol, will you tell us the name of your book? Oh, my book is True Bonds. Okay. Hey, that's, look at that. that. That's the way that's I look. Up. That's on Amazon. That's great. And uh, the one coming out is a novella. It's short. It's going to be called The Moment of Blonde Madness. It's a, it's a thriller. It's a thriller. Try to no, get, Steve, I want to no. get lifetime interested in the Blonde Madness. Oh, sure. Lifetime. Well, anyway, we're coming to the end of our show. Our first co-host, Carol, thank you so much for joining us. This has been very, really a lot of fun. For those of you who are listening, uh, we, we love uh, uh, hearing from you. If you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, you can email us at talesfromhollywoodland at gmail.com. We're on all the podcasts, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, where you get your podcasts. We will be there, Tales from Hollywoodland. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. Uh, we're all over the place. And Mike Faber does a good job of getting us out there. Thanks, Mike, as always. And guys, Arthur, Julian, uh, here's And we want to talk about uh, for, for the more people who could write in and be a guest host. Or yes, host. if you really want to be a guest host, just like Carol today, please write it. It to us at Tales from... Being with you people yeah. who are wonderful and just so classy. And uh, and and oh, I'd love to be on another time. Maybe when the book comes We will out. definitely keep you in mind, Carol, because you've got a good viewpoint in an area of Hollywood that's very interesting to us. We're so glad we, you survived all those casting couches. May the guys who uh, treated you badly, may they burn in hell. Anyways, <laughs> um, ha Happy New Year, everybody. Year, I'll talk to you soon. Burn in hell? You been wonderful. Burn in hell. <laughs> I second that motion. <laughs> What's new on the 42 cast? Let's ask my co-hosts. We're talking about Doctor Who. Comic book shows and movies. And we're talking about all things Star Trek. <laughs> and so much more. Check us out on Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and iTunes. It's only on the 42 cast. Your ultimate answer to fandom, geekiness, and everything. So Nathan, when are we finally talking Babylon 5? This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.